This is always a fun one, but especially meaningful this year with both teams coming in at 3-0 and and Arkansas much better than they've been in years. Texas A&M, Arkansas, we've got our guy, Andrew Hattersley, of course, from Gigum 247 Sports to break down the Aggies side. Hey, Andrew. Hey, how's it going, Mark? How are you doing? I'm doing well. What's going on? Well, doing great. And I'm SEC play is finally here, so that, you know, time to finally get going here and, and find out about find out about everybody. This is a game that I always try to make space to watch it. Yeah. I, I, I think it's interesting. And even though Arkansas has been down, if people check out the scores, and I was going through the scores yesterday, and uh, it brought to mind a lot remembrance of a lot of these games where Arkansas has been down um, you know, that, that last season, season and a half under Brad Bielema. And then of course the Chad Morris years were bad and, uh, Texas A&M, a much better team, much better program, but it's been a one score game since 2016. So Arkansas comes to play and now it appears as though they've got a much better team based on the first three games of the season. Yeah, this is always a, a kind of a battle and no matter whether Arkansas is good or bad, even in those, those rough Chad Morris years. Um, they still played a and real tough and had a chance two years ago um, in his final year to, to knock off a and m and didn't get it done, but it was still coming down the stretch. They had a chance to tie her win the game um, on the final drive. And remember they, they had a fourth down pass broken up. That was, that was dropped. Um, but they, yeah, they've, they've always played a and m tough. They always get up for this game and, um, it's it, it's going to be a good battle. You're you're right. This is probably as good as it's as it's been matchup wise in a while. Arkansas is has probably been one of the more consistent uh, teams so far this year, uh, just in terms of the way they played and and they they know their identity. They know who they are and and stick to it. I think A and M still trying to find out kind of who they are and and find some pieces. So this will be a good test because. You know, for both teams, you know, for A and M, it's A and M, it's Arkansas, and Mississippi State, and then Alabama coming to town. Um, for Arkansas, I know they they start their gauntlet now with with A and M, Georgia, and Auburn. I was listening to our guy Trey Biddy listed out yesterday, and it's just crazy what the rest of their schedule looks like. Um, so, you know, we're going to find out a lot about both these teams over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, after playing, of course, 10 SEC games coming off uh, all the difficult seasons that they've been through, I know Sam Pittman was making a big deal out of that during the uh, SEC media days about what kind of schedule uh, they've had. I think most of the metrics have ranked it uh, the most difficult schedule in the country for the second consecutive year. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, they, they're just going to be challenged every week going forward. And, you know, no game in the SEC is easy, though, just when you think about um, what each what each what each team does recruiting wise and and the athletes they have on the field. No game is really a gimme, so um, it'll be a good test. Yeah, Arkansas could win two or three games in the SEC and finish six and six or seven and five, but be one of the twenty best teams in the country. But they won't be ranked because of their record, but legitimately be better than teams ranked ahead of them. No question right. about that. I mean, even coming into the year, there were some people who looked at their schedule and, and saw Texas in game two and thought, oh, there's no way you know, Arkansas is even going to make a bowl just given what, what their schedule looks like. But that's why you play the games. And, you know, right now they're sitting at 3-0. and And, again, they've been – they've arguably played – been one of the more consistent teams all year. And, um, you know, you're right. They could win two to three games in the SEC and be and be bowl eligible. But they're a way better team than that. And uh, – and Sam Pittman's got them going in the right direction. And of course, they're playing an average team this week, so they should probably have no no problem with that. Now, that's uh, what Jimbo Fisher said, as Andrew told me before we started to record uh, about his football team. And I, I get the comment. Yeah, We all know, based on talent, Texas A&M is not an average football team, but they're playing pretty average football right now. Yeah, well, I think it kind of it kind of caught some people by surprise, but he was he was just speaking the truth. It was it came after um, they went over New Mexico. He was talking to the sideline reporter and said, you know, we're an average football team right now, and and kind of backed that up in the uh, in the post game press conference and said, you know, it's just the truth right now. They've got to get better in a lot of phases. Now he did say after he had a chance to go sit at home and watch the rest of 
college football action on Saturday. He said he felt a little bit better that, you know, he looks around the country and everybody's got kind of flaws right now and everybody's looking to, to find their way. But I think that comment, you know, kind of was a, was a bit of a challenge to his team to step it up as SEC plays here and raise the intensity. And he talks a lot about meeting the standard and, you know, it doesn't matter who you're playing or, you know, who's on the, who's on the schedule. They've got a standard they're trying to meet. And um, even Leon O'Neill has said this week, you know, if, if Jimbo wants us to play better, we've got to take it to another another level. And he was able to point out specific areas and, and just said, really, it comes down to details, attention to detail and some of the finer technique things that, you know, they're just a little off right now. And it's time to it's time to get going because, you know, you're going to be challenged the rest of the year. And if you're not playing up to the caliber you expect at this point, you're going to have problems in a hurry. Uh, I think that was just kind of a warning message to his team that, you know, it's time to go now. And they didn't score for the final quarter and a half against New Mexico. Um, kind of took their foot off the foot off the pedal, up 34 to nothing. And I think that was kind of his message. He wants to see them continue to play clean and, and, and pay attention to those details. And for anybody who wants to be a critic of Texas A&M's performance to date, you can look at the scores against Kent State and New Mexico, and they're pretty much in line with what you would expect. I think they were roughly a 31, 32 point favorite against New Mexico. They're right there. Same with Kent State. They were in the 29 to 30 point favorite range, and they won the game, I believe, 41 to 10. Yeah. Uh, it's a Colorado game. And of course, the circumstances involving the transition at quarterback with the entry to Haynes King, Zach Calzada having to step in and uh, can throw a football team. Uh, and they just, considering what Colorado then did turning around and playing Minnesota and just getting, getting completely shut down to like 63 yards of total offense and a 30 to nothing loss, different teams show up on different days and there are different matchups. So you can't take that complete comparison to say, oh, well, Minnesota is a lot better than Texas A&M. We know that's not the case, uh, but it, it is um, uh, a concerning look at a team against a pretty marginal team and that they weren't able to put that game away and beat Colorado to the extent that you would expect. Yeah, um, and no no question, Colorado got up for that game and they were, they were really ready to play and give credit to them for that. That was that was a game that they certainly gave A&M a lot of problems. Um I thought Zach Calzado played better this past week. He got in, they got in a rhythm and, and jumped out 14, nothing four plays in um, with a, with a touchdown pass to Devon Achain. Um, and m fans rejoiced when, when Devon Dimas um, caught his 70 yard touchdown pass for, for his first career catch and, and went for a touchdown. But I think when you look at so far through non-conference or through, through these non-conference games, um, the, the the problems have 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 kind of come come up front, and I think that's I think that's something that's a bit concerning when you look at Texas A and M. It it popped up in the Colorado game, and then to see it pop up in the New Mexico game, I know they were missing Layden Robinson and kind of had to shuffle the shuffle the offensive line around. But when New Mexico's front's kind of giving you problems and and living in the backfield and not allowing you to get the run game going, that's a little concerning with SEC play around the corner, and I. I think that's that's the one question mark with this team is can the offensive line gel heading into conference play now because they've got to be able to get to with with Zach Calzada at quarterback they've got to be able to get the running game going to to take some pressure off him I think he can make, I certainly think he can make enough pay, plays in the passing game um, but we've talked about this before they've got to keep him out of the third and tens third and elevens third and twelves or some of those long down and distant situations because that's when he tends to make his his mistakes or force the ball. If you keep him in third and manageable situations, he's got a he's got a very live arm and we saw that again this past weekend. But he's just got to limit the mistakes. He's got to limit the turnovers and um, that starts with 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 protecting him up front and getting Isaiah Spiller and Devon Achain going because those are certainly the two biggest weapons A and M has on offense. Aeneas Smith comes into the game with 13 receptions. Uh, is he banged up? Do we know exactly what his uh, injury status is? Yeah, so Jimbo Fisher's been a little coy about kind of where he is, and um, 
he's called him day to day. Um, he hasn't really described what the injury is. He he left during the second half of the New Mexico game, um, and so we'll see. He's, you know, we hope to get some more answers on him later this week. But that is something that's a bit of a question mark getting into this game. They need him against Arkansas, um, and they also need to get him more involved. He's only, you know, he had a big first week against. Kent State, but the past two weeks, uh, he's touched the ball only six times the past two weeks against Colorado and New Mexico. And for what he can do with the ball in his hands, they need to find a way to get him more involved, get him involved in, you know, whether it's coming out of the backfield or in the slot or or any way they can, they need to get him more involved. Traylon Burks, uh, one of the better deep threats in the SEC, if not the nation. Antonio Johnson, as you had mentioned before we started to record, off to an outstanding start. Tremendous player leads the team with 18 total tackles. That's a matchup to watch. Yeah, I think you could see those two matching up in the slot quite a bit because a And M's going to have Jalen Jones out on the, out on out on one at one corner spot, and I, I think they're pretty optimistic of of getting Miles Jones back full full go. He played a little bit this past week, and um, that kind of help gives gives a And M exactly what they're hoping for on the outside. Uh, but that's going to be a really interesting matchup because, you know, Arkansas likes to move Traylon Burks around a little bit, move him into the slot. and uh, um, So you, you'll probably see him matched up with Traylon Burks quite a bit, with Antonio Johnson quite a bit. And on, on, honestly, Antonio Johnson's been right up there as one of A&M's two to three best defenders so far this year. I know a, uh, Jimbo Fisher last week said, He's got a really, really bright future. He's only in his second year. Um, started in the Orange Bowl last year and is just a really good tackler and and loves to hit. So he he, he he's all about the SEC physicality. Traylon Burks, uh, with the emergence of the running game, hasn't been used quite as much this year. And with Arkansas leading games and not having to pass as much, caught 52 last year, 13 yeah. catches, 16 yards per catch, and a touchdown this year. But he led the SEC in uh, yards per catch last year at just about 19. So um, balance this year, Arkansas is, just in terms of, you, you're right, just in terms of them being able to run the ball. And um, obviously you've got Traylon Smith, who, who's got, 42 carries for 216 yards and and I mean they've got five guys averaging over 100 yard or that have over 100 yards on the ground so far this season so there's certainly a lot of ways they can they can you know get things going on the ground just want to uh double check one stat there I thought as soon as I had said that that I might have been a little bit off Traylon Burks did catch 52 passes last year. I was right about that. Now I double check myself. 16 yards per catch, not 19. I believe I was speaking of Mike Woods, who left as yeah. a transfer to Oklahoma, who was the deep threat at 19 yards per catch that led the SEC last year. All right. Uh, got Andrew Hattersley on the line, as we always do, to talk Texas A&M football. Check out uh, Andrew's work at Gigum 247 Sports. And, um, uh, Big game coming up uh, this weekend, of course. Arkansas 3-0, and Texas A&M 3-0. and Both teams step in SEC play for the first time. Yeah. And, um, you know, we we set up this this matchup in the passing game with Arkansas throwing the ball to Traylon Burks, but this is going to be um, a man's game. Uh, Arkansas took on Texas, and Texas was coming off a three-score win against uh, what we think is a really good Louisiana team. And Arkansas ran the ball down their throats like they determined to run the ball and they did. And then on the other side of the ball, we're strong enough up front, not necessarily to shut down Bijan Robinson, but they held him in check. And it was, so it was a pretty impressive physical performance on both sides of the ball from this Arkansas team. Yeah, this is going to be, I think this game's going to come down to who wins in the trenches and, you know, A&M's got a really, really good defensive line um, playing pretty well right now. Michael Clemens, is off to a great start. Um, Jaden Peavy has really kind of been solid in the in the middle as a as a senior leader there. And this past week they got back McKinley Jackson, um, and so he he kind of helps just in terms of the run game and, and what they're able to do um, defending the run. He's just a really physical presence inside. And and make no mistake about it, Jimbo Fisher's talked about it this week that. This is this is going to be big boy ball against Arkansas, and I think that's been the message that he's hammered home to his offensive line. To his offensive line specifically, I think he kind of mentioned this last week. You've got to be able to move people, 
um, you keep it, you know, it's 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 fine and well to get a hat hat on the hat and and do all that, but you've got to be able to move people and you've got to play physical. Um, and I think that's been his biggest message to his offensive line this week is you've got to get kind of aggressive, you got to get nasty, and and you got to be able to move people in the run game. Um, and then some of those finer technical points he was talking about, of, you know, maybe you're a, you know foot off on a block or you're kind of, you know, not quite getting around the edge like you need to. But um, Arkansas's defensive line is going to challenge A&M, and um, they've got to be able to run the ball on Saturday. And I think if whichever team, because if you're, if, you're, if you're A&M defensively, your, your hope is to be able to, um, and I think this would go for Arkansas too, is to force, force – KJ Jefferson into being a passer. And I think Arkansas is trying to do the same thing to keep the game in the hands of Zach Calzada and force him to make plays with his arm. And um, on AM side, you're trying to shut down that running game and, and, and force, force KJ Jefferson to beat you with his arm because he, we know he can beat you with his legs. Um, but I think that, I think that's the strategy for AM going into this week. And it starts with winning the line of scrimmage, stopping the running game and um, forcing them to be one dimensional. And I know that these coaches teach and preach process and not playing against the opponent, but playing against the standard and all those things make total sense because you're trying to instill excellence and the goal of excellence and not, okay, we're beating this team 50 to nothing. It doesn't really matter, but there's got to be something that psychologically plays with a, a player that even though you're, that's your intent, that you know what the name is on your jersey going out against the name on that jersey and what you're expected to do against a Kent State or against a New Mexico. And then when it turns out to be true during the first quarter and you know, okay, we're up two scores, now we're up three scores, that the intensity, it's just human nature, isn't going to be what it is when you know, okay, we're playing Arkansas this week. They beat Texas bad. We know that they pretty much match up with us physically. This is going to be a dogfight. Yeah, for sure. And I think I, I, I don't think there's anybody on either side that, that you know, doesn't recognize this is going to be a dog fight and um, could well be a one possession game coming into the fourth quarter um, and, and late in the fourth quarter. Either way, um, you're right. And I think that was I think that was kind of Jimbo Fisher's point is you can't let up and you can't you know, you got to be able to maintain that that intensity and that standard. He talks a lot about standard and meeting the standard and the, you know, the standard is the standard. It's one of his favorite phrases and you're right. It's, it's, it's one of those things where he wants to see a team for, for 60 minutes, be able to do it consistently. And um, I do think it makes a difference. It's just human nature when you're, when you're, when you're a player to let off, let off the gas, especially, you know, in the New, 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 New Mexico game, that game was, was in control pretty quickly. It was, it was pretty much over by halftime. Um, and so you're right. I mean, you just want to see them play with a standard, with a consistency. And I think that's what Arkansas has done, you know, to this point, other than that first half against Rice, has played to a standard and played consistently, played physical. They know exactly who they are. They're going to stick to it. And um, I think that's why they've been one of the better stories in college football so far. Yeah, Texas A&M taking on Arkansas, and like we said off the top, this has been a struggle for the Aggies, even when they had much better football teams, because this has been just an interesting rivalry in the SEC Western Division, and of course the Hogs were much, much improved last year, coming from no wins in the SEC for two consecutive years to three and seven, and they were much better than that. Uh, they were in every game and kind of got ripped off once or twice <laughs> in very <laughs> controversial um, situations <laughs> late in the game. And they're even better, it appears, this year based on the one big test against Texas. And, and much like we talked about with uh, Texas A&M playing inferior foes, Arkansas went out and beat down at least in the second half with Rice and pretty much start to finish against Georgia Southern teams that over the last five or six years they've struggled with and lost to the likes of Western Kentucky and Toledo and Colorado State, and those days seemingly are gone, and Arkansas football's back and uh, climbing up the SEC. So, um, you know, each rivalry has a, a different feel to it. Uh, I can't think of another one in the SEC that's played at a neutral site. This is the one 
And uh, the SEC has done different things with rivalries where for years and years and years before Texas A&M joined the league, LSU and Arkansas would play on the Friday after Thanksgiving. That was kind of a designated spot. And then with Texas A&M joining the league, the SEC kind of pushed Arkansas out of the way, wanted to match them up with Missouri as their non-division rival that they play every year and move Texas A&M into that game against LSU on the final weekend of the season. Now we got this game that's a kind of a la Oklahoma, Texas, a neutral site game and has been for quite a while. Uh, but different people have different thoughts about whether that should be the case uh, playing in an NFL stadium. Yeah, I think both. Um, I know Ross Bjork's been abundantly clear about this, that the contract when it's up in 2024 um, needs to be moved back to being on campuses. And I think Arkansas feels the same way, to be honest. I know, I think, I don't know if they're necessarily thrilled um, just with the way this all worked out of, you know, A&M getting a home game in Arkansas um, and then Arkansas not getting a home game in return. But I think Arkansas, if I, if I remember correctly, is going to get the first game when it does go back to being um, on campuses. So I think from A&M's perspective, you know, you don't want to give them two straight home games as well. So it's kind of, it's kind of one of those things where, yeah, I think this will be. I'll, I think this will be the best neutral site game though in a while. Just in terms of you know, with we talked about Arkansas and you know the program being on the rise the way it is. I think you'll see Arkansas fans turn out in droves this weekend um, to AT and T Stadium, and we know A and M fans always travel well, and um, they'll certainly be 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 loud and and into the game as well on Saturday. So it should be a really good environment. Um, and maybe what they were hoping for with the with a neutral site game, and um, I, th- I think this will be a good, this will be a pretty good environment to to play in. But I, I I know both both sides are really looking forward to getting the game back on campus, and and that should start happening once the contract's up in in 2024. Andrew's going to be at the ball game, and we're going to have post game for you after the game on the main channel, and uh, just. Uh, Stay tuned to the Voice of College Football. I'll let you know exactly where we're going to be, but we hope to be on the various channels connected with Texas A&M. And, uh, but we plan on being on the main channel for post-game coverage with Andrew um, an hour or so after the game. Andrew, appreciate you stopping by, breaking this one down. Uh, anything we've missed? Nope, I think that covers it. Yeah, thank you as always. It, it, uh, it should be a good one on Saturday, and we'll – I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about after that game, and um, I think we'll have a much better idea of of both teams coming out of that game, especially A and M, just just in terms of where they are. And um, you know, I think I think once once that Arkansas game is done, it's Mississippi State and then Alabama's coming to town. So this this is a big couple of weeks for A and M now. Absolutely, no question about it. Well, enjoy the game, Andrew. Thanks Thank for coming you. on as always. Thank you very much.